In the last video, we looked at sequence-to-sequence -sequence models for speech recognition. And these have been incredibly successful, and they have greatly increased the accuracy of transcription. However, they are very data-hungry and can take hundreds of hours for them to start reacting and transcribing appropriately. In this video, we're going to look at the opposite situation. We're going to look at languages that have maybe two or three hours of transcribed text and how we can make systems that can uh, transcribe those languages. We're going to look in general at low resource natural language processing and a specific example from a technique called forced alignment. So our first problem is that obviously there's much less data to train. Try to think of an example like Bribri or Cook Islands Maori. There are no movies in Cook Islands Maori, and those movies are not going to have the subtitles in Cook Islands Maori. So you cannot use that to train a system. There's no newscasts with closed captioning, and so you cannot use that either. There's not many printed books. The only printed books that there are really are the ones for schools. And so there's very little text that you can use to train systems like engrams. Because there's so little data, it's obviously going to be much more difficult to train an NLP system. Not only that, but generating new data is not only expensive, much more expensive and difficult than it would be for a language like English. For example, maybe not a lot of people in this community read and write regularly because there's no book, so why would there be a need? And maybe the only people in this community who reads and writes often is the school teacher. And school teachers are fabulously busy. So it will be very difficult to steal from their time for them to transcribe a bunch of audio so that we can use that to train an NLP system. There will be very few people who would have the expertise and the time to do transcriptions of a smaller language. And so getting the data is more expensive and more difficult. In addition to this, these languages are going to be in different sociolinguistic environments. Many indigenous languages are in situations where the community speaks both the indigenous language and some colonial language, like English or Spanish. This is the case in the Cook Islands, where people speak English and Cook Islands Maori. And the, the, real, the, the realistic situation that you have is that in a single conversation, they're going to go back and forth between them. In addition to this, because of historical reasons, English sometimes has a structure that does not match other languages. This might sound silly, but it has interesting consequences. For example, English is not morphologically rich. If you want to have all of the forms of a verb in English, you need to look at very few words. For example, walk, walking, walks, walked. If you want all the forms of a verb in Spanish, it will be at least 30 forms. And if you want all the forms of a verb in an even richer, in a morphologically richer language like Turkish or Finnish, you're going to be looking at hundreds of different words. This will have an impact on our systems. For example, you're going to need a much larger corpus to get the same amount of information. Um, here we have an example of sizes of different corpora for English, Finnish, Estonian, Turkish, and how many unique tokens can you get from corpora of different sizes. So for example, if you have a corpus of 44 million words in English, you're only going to see about 200,000 unique tokens. This means that you're going to get, for, for each of those 200,000, on average, you're going to get many um, iterations of the same word that your speech recognition program can train on. So it's going to see the word tree and house many times um, in its corpus. So it will have an opportunity to learn a lot. This is going to be different from languages like Finnish, where because of the morphology, it, there are many more unique tokens. So in a corpus of the same size, there's about 2 million unique tokens. So on average, um, the system will see a tenth of the information, because now those 44 million words correspond to 2 million unique tokens, whereas they corresponded to 200,000 in the English. So it's going to get about, on average, about a tenth 
of the information per token as it did uh, for English. So it's going to have to learn from a lot less. So how can we uh, perform learning in these kinds of situations? One alternative that uh, where there's a lot of research going on is called transfer learning, where you train, for example, a neural network on one language like English, and then use only a small part and retrain it for some other language. Maybe, for example, you can train a neural network to identify the phones of English and then, for example, lop off the final layer and then add a new layer and train it so that all this phonetic information is now going to analyze sounds in Cook Islands Maori. So you use a network with information from a large language and then you either replace the, fi the final layer with a new layer trained on your token for the smaller language or you can add an additional layer onto a model you already have for fine tuning of a model. Notice that this is similar to what BERT did, where it had a general training phase and then additional fine tuning for some specific task. This is called one shot learning because you learn a lot with a large language and then you learn, a, you learn in the final stage with whatever little data you have for the smaller language. But you do train a little bit in that phase. There's a different type of learning called zero shot learning, where you, where you do not train, but you try to manipulate the output to match your new categories. This is an example of a confnet that is trained to recognize things like arms, hand, shirt, for example. And let's say we want to use it to recognize something it has never seen before, like a skirt. If you feed this image to the system that has never been trained to see skirts, it's going to process it and it's going to give you some result vector that will say, this is kind of a shirt, but not really. So it's going to have a result that is not really good for shirt. And then what the computer can do is try to map that result vector onto other similar categories with uh, some related knowledge. For example, we could use a word to vec model where the system gives us a word to vec and as an output. And we know that this is a word to vec that doesn't quite match shirt. So we're going to look for things that are close to shirt. And in the system, skirt is much closer to shirt than shoulder, for example. So the system is going to make a bet that this object is a kind of shirt and it's going to call it skirt. So as you can see, zero shot uses a network as is, inputs data it has never seen before, it, it's going to give you some sort of output, and then you have to adjust that output onto the new things that you want to detect with the network. We can use this for language. This is an example for machine translation. This system, the description of it is below, sees pairs for English and Korean and Japanese, and uh, English and Japanese. So English, Korean, English, and Japanese are the ones that it does see. And then it has to zero shot Japanese to Korean and Korean to Japanese. So this translation system, again, has been trained on data from English to Korean and from English to Japanese and vice versa. And then it has to figure out what the translation is between Japanese and Korean by zero sh uh, shotting it. How can it possibly do that? It's going to try to do this. When it produces a translation, for example, from English to Korean or from English to Japanese, it's going to map each of those translations to a semantic vector, something that describes the rough meaning of the sentences. So if you plotted them, you would, know, uh, you would get clusters where sentences with similar meanings would go together. For example, in this cluster here, there are sentences that are very similar in meaning. Stratosphere extends 10 kilometers and in Korean and Japanese. Here, the, uh, the orange ones are in English, the blue ones in Korean, and the red ones in Japanese. And so the computer would have a mapping of things that resemble one another. And it would try to find from, uh, if it has a Korean input like this, it could find the Japanese dot that resembles it the most. 
it got the Korean Japanese dots from the English input, but then we can use a Korean input to map a similar Japanese output. So as you can see, we have a, a network trained on one type of data, then we give it a different type of data, and we perform some operation on the output to map it onto something else. So we get a Korean sentence, we have as an output some sort of English sentence or some intermediate semantic form that then we map onto a Japanese form, and we have performed zero-shot translation without ever having seen Korean and Japanese. How would this work with audio? For example, you could take a system that learns uh, the alphabet transcriptions of English sounds, where you have English sounds, a lot of data from English, and from there you get descriptions of what it's hearing. For example, it's hearing a vowel or a consonant, and the vowel may be fronted or not. And so from these, the computer will select the compatible alphabet representation in English. What you could do next is give input, for example, in Cook Islands Maori, that will give you a phoneme a output to the neural network, like phoneme features, that is not quite there. It's very similar to English transcriptions, but not quite. And so what you could do is remap that output onto the correct transcriptions categories for Cook Islands Maori. And so you have something that hears based on its English data, but transcribes Cook Islands Maori because it finds similarities between the output and Cook Islands Maori. If you get, uh, you can get creative with these kinds of systems. And this is uh, a project I was involved with. If you have an English trained model, for example, and you provide Cook Islands Maori input, you could get something that sounds like Cook Islands Maori. And through an additional mapping and correction, you can get that to be Cook Islands Maori phonemic transcription. We did this with a technique called forced alignment. In forced alignment, you get an audio input and a, for example, a TXT file as input with the words in the recording. And then the computer is going to try to find for each word what its position is in the recording. So for example, here I gave it a text file that said one, two, three. I recorded myself saying one, two, three. And the computer found that temporally there's a two right here. And so it gives me a time aligned output that tells me that from here to here, there's the word two. And it even tells me that this is where the t and the u are supposed to be. So this is forced alignment, taking a recording and a transcription and trying to find where the words are. It works similar to what we've studied before. It analyzes the spectrogram. It takes the results from each of the windows and puts it into a number of clusters using a kind of unsupervised clustering. It uses those clusters to then make hidden Markov models. So for example, here we would have the transcriptions of the clusters that represent sounds like, oh, and here we would have the sounds that sound like a v, like an alveolar explosion. So, uh, <laughs> and from this, you would get alphabet representations. And finally, the system types tries to take these alphabet representations and map them to an orthographic form. What we did was modify the lexicon so that it would list, it would be listening to weird words of English that were actually Cook Islands Maori. So we added the orthographic forms for the Cook Islands Maori, in this example, Kiora na Toto, hi everyone, and then gave it a mapping onto in potential English sounds. So we made it think that this sentence in Cook Islands Maori actually sounded like Kiora na Tato. And in this way, it could a, a component that was trained in English could listen to Cook Islands Maori, give you weird English as an output, and then we would map that output onto Cook Islands Maori words and sounds. And it works. It, incredibly, it works. This system has a 91% accuracy for detecting the center of words and an 80% accuracy for detecting the center of vowels. So again, this is a system that is trained on, on English sounds. It has knowledge of English sounds, and then we can bootstrap that to get to try to 
haven't figured out what are the sounds from Cook Island Maori. It's not going to be as accurate as it is for English, but it is a good way to increase your accuracy and to get started with producing more data. We have used this to study the language of the Cook Islands. This is one example. Here, we have islands that don't get a lot of tourists, like Atiu and Mauke. As you can see, they have vowels E, A, A, O, U, like we studied previously in the week. These are the islands that do get a lot of tourists. For example, Aitutaki and Rarotonga. We have E, A, A, O, and then this U is in a different position. It's like central, so it would sound more like U. Interestingly, this is also the sound of the U in New Zealand. So we have the hypothesis that because these islands get a lot of tourists and most of them come from New Zealand, New Zealand English is exerting a change onto the sounds of the Cook Islands Maori spoken in these islands, but not in these ones that have fewer uh, tourists coming in. And I'm um, sorry, we did this with thousands, with 5,000 tokens of vowels, which we could extract because we had the English model listening to the Cook Island Maori data. In summary, low resource languages have less data for us to train on. The data is just more expensive to get. And potentially, you have to learn from sparser data, depending on the structure of the language. One of the alternatives that people have done research on is called transfer learning, which is using a neural network that was designed for one task or data and use it for a different task or data. In one-shot learning, you train just a tiny bit of the neural network to adjust to your new data. In zero-shot learning, you take a previously existing neural network and map its output onto some new uh, kind of output that you want. And people are, get creative with these kinds of solutions to try to get uh, to bootstrap models from very large languages to detect information from languages they have never seen before like Cook Islands Maori.